What is this? <sighs> Have I been saying increases the whole time? I mean, deep. So I knew I wanted to recreate at least one of the iconic costume items featured in the film. But which one? One of Uncle Rico's two blue sweaters that made him look like the missing member of Mystery Inc. A simplified version of Deb's 80s prom dress bodice. Or, of course, Napoleon's infamous Vote for Pedro t-shirt. This t-shirt was an unpretentious symbol of the pure, wholesome, and utterly heartwarming friendship between a local and the new kid in town. Who was I kidding? I'm a basic bitch. Seeing as there's already a sea of clones littered around the interwebs like sequins in a Las Vegas dressing room, I figured why not create my own, nay, why not knit my own? Bah. Before we begin, I'll be uploading tutorials for the methods I use in this project over on my second channel, Jaded, so don't worry if you don't quite catch everything here. The link is in the description below. And so the design process began. In my mind. Look, is the t-shirt okay? How wrong could it go? First, I had to choose the yarn. Here's the thing, it's a little difficult to tell what kind of red the text is. It's pretty obvious that some interpretations have pretty much stolen the red from the Windows 95 version of paint, and other references only made me question the colour correction of my screen. But that's beside the point. What that meant was finding a not-so-red red. A red who is yet to be told that its estranged father is actually a Creole the salmon pink. Apologies for the cursed image. Some of you may think that I'm making a pretty huge deal after something quite trivial. But I disagree. However, should you make this t-shirt for yourself, use whichever colour works for you. For the white, I made sure to use a soft, warm, white baby yarn, and not the cool fluorescent type that you often find grinning in the bulk yarn bin, like when Ross became overzealous with his teeth whitening. And I know I was fussy with the red, but I was more concerned with the twist and strand count of the black yarn than the shade itself. I have a sinking feeling that it's not going to work. I wasn't about to spend an extra week knitting excess fabric that I'd only end up tucking away, so continuing with the postmodern, somewhat undefined era of the movie, I decided to re-adopt the 90s baby tee and combine it with the ringer tee, which made yet another resurgence in the noughties. If this isn't a portrait of lost millennial youth, I don't know what is. I'm not talking about the tiny, almost empire-line crop tops of recent years, but the OG baby tee with the faintest waist-to-hip flare. In other words, the slightest hint of what the industry likes to call women's fitted. Since the goal was to emulate a sewn t-shirt pattern, I figured the best process of construction would be to work from the bottom to the top, since a raglan would be completely out of the question. However, instead of knitting the exact panels and sewing them together, knitting in the round would mean skipping the stitching stage at the end. And, seeing as I pretty much exhausted my newfound enthusiasm for the mattress stitch throughout my previous videos, this wasn't much of a choice to make. So I marked my pseudo side seams and used them to make my increases and decreases for the main body and sleeves. To keep things extra simple, both the front and back had the same number of stitches. Is it a t-shirt if it doesn't have a cover stitched hem? Technically, it still is, because the hem has barely anything to do with anything, but we're not going for a 2010's Pinterest DIY aesthetic. I want that generic suburban print shop finishing. I'm organizing a corporate team building exercise it. To make the hem for the t-shirts, I'm going to fold up my work and I'm going to pick up from the first row, which I believe is this stitch here, because you can see the yarn end. And then I'm going to knit it together with one of my live stitches, like so. And then again, I'm going to pick up a stitch from my first row, which is essentially more like my cast on than the first row, and then knit it together with a live stitch. And you can see already it's starting to form the hem. It's not too thick, which is ideal. Talk about a plot twist. My work is completely twisted. As it turned out, my round was in fact twisted like a Mobius strip bagel. Except this time it was not an efficient vessel for extra cream cheese, but for my ever-growing existential despair. 27 rows in. That's right, 27. Actually, before I do this, I'm going to put this on the stand and see how it fits, and I might actually make some adjustments. So, this could actually be a positive. Okay. And well, what do you know? This is a bit too big. Maybe 5-6 inches too big? So it turned out that my genius idea of only utilising long cabled circular needles was nothing short of self-sabotage. Sure, the magic loop exists, but since when did magic solve all of our problems? The direction of the stitches was simply impossible to gauge, and only on my third or fourth attempt, using a set of 40cm needles, did I successfully free myself from the cursed four-dimensional object. With the shaping of the waist out of the way, it was time to part the C. C for circle, of course. What on earth were you thinking? 
I decided to start off by knitting the back and the main reason was so that I could procrastinate against shaping the neckline for as long as possible. Think about it. Because my yarn ends on the back panel, I'm going to slip all the stitches off of the front panel and I'm going to put them onto a stitch holder. If you don't have one of these, that's totally fine. What I would do is I would get a darning needle and some yarn and just thread that needle and the yarn through all the stitches. If anything, it's probably better to do that because it's more flexible. I have found that sometimes with these holders, the stitches can escape. So if that does happen to me, I will be resorting to the needle and yarn. So watch this space. Okay, wait, I just remembered there's that sloped cast off stitch. So I'm gonna give that a go now. So to do that, what I'll need to do is... Ooh, does this still work? So I'd have to undo this stitch and put my needle through like so. No, no. What? One, two, three. Okay, I shouldn't have done that. Oops. Oh no. Okay, I'll get back to you. Ooh, I actually found my bigger stitch holder. Now I'm about to finish this row. What I'm going to do is I'm going to purl until the one right before the last one, like that, and then I'm going to flip my work over and do another cast off. And this time I'm going to knit instead of purl. Knit that first stitch or purl it, depending on which side you're on, and then just cast it off. You don't have to knit or purl another one. And that's your sloped cast off. I've literally avoided so many cast off elements in my projects because of this, not knowing how to do this. So if you take anything from this video, please let it be. Okay, I'll say it like it is. It's at this precise point that I should have increased the width towards the top because, <clears throat> madam, we have shoulders. But I didn't because patience is a virtue I'm still trying to purchase via toxic self-help guru courses. Despite my disposition, I still managed to make some decreases on both sides for the armholes. Yay me. Eventually, I came to a point where I could procrastinate no longer. The neckline was nigh. For a more detailed explanation of how to shape a neckline from the bottom up, you can check out my checkered vest tutorial here. First, I cast off symmetrically from the center back panel. Then, with subsequent rows, I cast off stitches in decreasing numbers with each row. A very key point to mention is that after casting off the middle section, I had to work on one side first before moving on to the other side. To be honest, this is why I much prefer knitting raglan style wherever possible. Not being able to complete at least two things at once makes me far too aware of my own mortality. The ordeal was far from over. Why? The front panel, of course. And well, what can I say? It was pretty much the same as the back, but instead I lifted the angle of the armhole line and cast off earlier for a lower neckline. The interesting part was yet to come. Okay, so I was really into the mattress stitch, but that was only for vertical joining. Do you find yourself dreading horizontal joins? Are you tired of those awkward raised seams? Maybe you just never want to lay eyes on another crochet hook again in your life. Well, look no further. Introducing the Kitchener Stitch, the answer to all your shoulder seam problems. To cast off using the Kitchener Stitch is a lot easier than it looks. It's just one of those things that takes a bit of practice, but once you've got it, it's really straightforward. Okay, so to start, I'm just using the yarn end. So you're going to take your needle and you're going to insert it purlwise into the front needle stitch. And then you're going to insert knitwise into the back stitch. And that's how you start the kitchen stitch. So to begin with, we're going to knit off the first front stitch. And then we're going to insert purlwise into the second front stitch. And then we're going to purl off the first back stitch and then knit insert into the second one. I won't lie, this one was a little tricky to get right in one attempt and I cannot express how confusing it is to undo the stitch once you inevitably discover your first error. And as if that wasn't enough, trying to figure out how to redo it midway through felt like navigating a house of mirrors after suffering a mild concussion. But as always, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, but like a non-head injury related one. I'll be truthful, I was half relieved to have finished the main body, but I was also topped up with dread. Like the neckline, I was low-key devastated that one sleeve would naturally have to follow the other because symmetry means repetition. Repetition means an absence of surprise, and an absence of surprise means boredom. But hey, this is knitting. If you're not willing to harbour the constant hum of sheer inefficiency when it comes to creating fabric by hand, stitch by stitch, with nothing but two sticks and some string, then what are you doing here? So this is my sleeve progress. I've used German short rows to make the top longer, and now I'm going to add the coloured band. Things were going so well that I swiftly moved on to the second and final sleeve. 
I was on a high, the one you only get from working a project in a prolonged state of flow. So to cast off, I'm going to go through this garter stitch here, and then I'm going to insert my darning needle into the first two stitches, pull, and then I'm going to cast the first one off knitwise. And then the wave of sobriety came crashing in. What is this? Like they say, getting drunk on stitches is nothing more than borrowing happiness from tomorrow. And it was time to pay it back. With interest. This kind of reminds me of those little hoop tunnels. Um, yeah, it's not a great look. I think to fix it, what I'll need to do is obviously frog everything. And I have come to terms with it. I feel better about it. So I need to add some decreases here because it's... It's this part that's making it really odd. I also have to redo all of this because if you look on this side, everything looks kind of normal. On this side, there are some pearl stitches that are kind of coming through and I need to actually go in and pick those up. And that was because I was rushing things. So let this be another lesson to myself. Stop rushing. So now I have two sleeves and a collar that need to be frogged. It was all out of sheer impatience. Oh, hello. Look, all I wanted was a cute cap sleeve look and sure, I had decided on this midway through the actual process of knitting, but nonetheless, this was not it. Of course, to make myself feel somewhat better about this entire situation, I decided to at least complete the contrast colour first, using the same fold over and stretch cast off. Finally, the shirt was done. All that was left to complete was a duplicate stitch embroidery on top, i.e. the most crucial part of the entire shirt. So, there's a pretty good reason why I decided to go with a duplicate stitch over intarsia, despite being more familiar with the latter. Here's an intarsia test sample I made shortly before starting the project. You can not only see that the wrong side looked like it had been mauled by a small wildcat, but there was also a real tension problem with the top left stitch. I also found this problem to be the case in other samples for my next project, so it didn't really seem like a problem that was going to disappear anytime soon. So I learned how to make the duplicate stitch. To help with locating and plotting stitches, I used the contrasting yarn to tack through the centre front. Although this helped a lot at the beginning, it became more and more redundant as I made further progress. You can tell that I've started with the centermost letters to make the stitches a lot easier to count. And so I soldiered on. Again and again, my impatience would get the better of me and I would stubbornly move ahead, barely adhering to the grid pattern. Luckily, undoing duplicate stitches is far safer and less fiddly than unraveling intarsia. It was, however, a much longer process. Swings and roundabouts. The finish line was nearing, and the poles were about to open. The moment you've all been waiting for. Vote for Pedro. Pedro, Pedro for Pedro. class president. Vote for Pedro. Pedro. Vote for Pedro. Pedro for class president. Vote for Pedro. 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 Ped